We'll talk a little bit about their habitat needs, uh, the, their growth rates, the size of brook trout, um, just some of their vital rates. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about their life cycle, the range here in Pennsylvania, as well as throughout the, the eastern U.S. Um, we'll talk s a little bit more in depth about the our, our brook trout resources that we have here in Pennsylvania. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, some of the challenges that are facing brook trout as we move into the future, as well as some opportunities that we have uh, to try to benefit brook trout. So uh, brook trout, is, as we commonly uh, call them, um, actually have a, have a scientific name as, as do all uh, uh, fish and, and, and wildlife and, and trees and so forth. So uh, the, the actual scientific name of brook trout is Salvalinus fontanalis and, and, and brook trout are a member of the, uh, the char family, which is uh, of uh, what the Salvalinus um, part of the name uh, stands for. And uh, so they're in the same family as uh, uh, other char species, such as lake trout, uh, bull trout, and um, uh, Arctic char, for example. And then fontanalis means of springs or uh, fountains. So, um, you know, brook trout certainly um, are uh, well known for inhabiting uh, spring fed streams and uh, areas with. Uh, with uh, cold, clean water. So that's what the, the second half of the species uh, of, the, of the name. So we have the genus Salvalinus and the species is Fontanalis. So enough of the scientific uh, naming, but uh, uh, you may have also heard brook trout uh, called other local names such as hemlock trout, mountain trout, and speckled trout. So uh, they do go by a number of different names. So next, let's talk a little bit about habitat and, and what brook trout require to be able to to inhabit a waterway. So as, as I mentioned previously, uh, brook trout need cold, cold clean water. Uh, this is this is absolutely critical uh, for their survival. And we generally find uh, brook trout occurring in, in streams that have watersheds with high percentage of forest cover and limited development. And currently brook trout uh, mostly inhabit headwater streams here in Pennsylvania and throughout most of their um, eastern native range. Uh, but there are some systems uh, that have uh, uh, limestone uh, systems that have older spring seeps that come in throughout their length. And uh, we do have brook trout also occurring in, in some of those, those systems, larger systems. And, um, and brook trout certainly seasonally use uh, uh, large waters that may become too warm in the summertime. So, um, for example, we've done a lot of work in, in a part of the state that I work in, in the West Branch of the Susquehanna River, and, and we found brook trout using the West Branch of the Susquehanna River seasonally to uh, migrate and to uh, recolonize streams, for example, that have been, uh, uh, have had uh, water quality improvements uh, following um, like acid mine drainage remediation efforts and so forth. So they certainly will use larger systems, and, and the more we learn about uh, trout over the years, uh, both here in the eastern U.S. and the western U.S., we, we've, we've realized how, how important it is to have populations connected to one another. So one of the certainly one of the issues as we move forward is is connectivity such as uh, um, so that we have, uh, you know, the tributaries uh, connected to those those larger main stems. Um, so brook trout also uh, inhabit uh, lakes, uh, especially as uh, we get further north into their native range. Um, not too much in Pennsylvania. We do have some brook trout that, that inhabit some some smaller reservoirs and, and there are some uh, natural lakes in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, but primarily um, this is further north in Pennsylvania, um, upper New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, where, where brook trout are, uh, are found um, inhabiting uh, lake systems. And um, and obviously further north up into Canada, but certainly for, for the lakes that they inhabit, they also need to have uh, cold, clean water. And, and most of our lakes here in Pennsylvania just uh, get uh, far too warm to be able to support brook trout on a year round basis. But certainly where we have brook trout present, uh, present they're uh, indicators of, of superior water quality. So we often use them as what we call an indicator species or or canaries in the coal mine. So if we if we have brook trout uh, present, we know uh, um, that overall we're likely to have a healthy aquatic ecosystem in that, in that stream. So next uh, we'll move into talking a little bit about the growth, diet, 
um, temperature uh, of brook trout. So uh, growth is really variable. It depends on the local conditions uh, within a, a given stream. Uh, it's, it's often slow. Uh, our headwater streams generally have uh, low fertility, um, low productivity, and uh, you know there's not an abundance of food resources in those in those systems. So often that that does uh, result in uh, slower growth, which which is the natural um, is natural for these upland systems. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, the, the brook trout that do uh, perhaps take on a more of a migratory life history where they're using larger systems, at least for part of the year, um, we tend to see them uh, get to a larger size. So uh, their primary diet consists of insects. Um, this would be a combination of aquatic and, and terrestrial insects. So aquatic meaning the insects that live in the water, terrestrial meaning land-based insects. Um, some of the common aquatic insects that brook trout feed on are uh, mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies, and some examples of the terrestrial insects that they uh, they prefer to eat are, are ants, beetles, um, grasshoppers. So um, they're primary, primarily insectivores, uh, but they will also eat other fish. Um, a couple examples of some other fish that we, um, you know, do find brook trout uh, consuming would be uh, scalpins, uh, dace, you know, others. Uh, most of these systems that brook trout occur in have have only a handful of fish species at most that, that, that live in them. A lot of times it's just uh, scalpins and, and brook trout in the, in the far reaches of the headwaters. So uh, they will consume scalpins. Um, I've even seen them take salamanders as well, uh, but primarily their diet is, is insect based. Um, the temperature is, is really important, and I think that's one of the take home messages for, for tonight. Um, so certainly brook trout prefer cold water temperatures uh, and require cold water temperatures. And within uh, the, the, their thermal regime, their preferred temperature range is, uh, is around 55 to 60 degrees is, is what provides optimum uh, feeding and growth. Um, temperatures that exceed 68 degrees uh, result in, in, in stress uh, on the brook trout. And uh, we, we generally find a few brook trout present in waterways that uh, uh, regular, regularly exceed uh, 68 degrees in the summertime. In their upper uh, lethal temperature uh, limit is, is around 73 or 74 degrees. So um, certainly if the waters are getting above, uh, above that um, limit, then we're not going to find brook trout there. And as I said, uh, water temperature is really important and it's, it's the number one primary limiting factor that affects the distribution of, of brook trout here in Pennsylvania and, and throughout its, its uh, native eastern range. And this is going to become even more important as, as we're faced uh, with climate change moving into the future. So I'll talk a little bit of, more about that in, in the uh, um, later in a presentation. But if you know if you're wondering why, well, why isn't uh, where are brook trout present in uh, in uh, you know in a small stream with uh, uh, you know, in more of an urban environment, it's, you know, it's primarily going to be uh, uh, because of the water temperatures getting too warm to support them. So let's talk a little bit about it, uh, the size of brook trout and, and some of their uh, longevity or life expectancy. So um, brook trout are generally short lived uh, and they don't attain a large size in most of our headwater stream six systems. Uh, maximum size often ranges from six to 10 inches occasionally uh, we see an 11 or 12 inch, but certainly uh, 10, 11 or 12 inches is a rare, a rare brook trout in a, in a headwater stream system. Um, they will attain some larger sizes um, in more fertile systems. Uh, Big Spring Creek in Cumberland County is an example of where uh, um, some uh, uh, excellent restoration work has occurred uh, by Fish and Boat Commission and other partners. And uh, there are some some larger brook trout that are occurring in, in that limestone system that has uh, higher fertility and, and more um, consistent conditions throughout the year. Um, and it, obviously in the lakes and uh, larger rivers, I could also expect to see larger trout occurring in the, in the northern uh, portions of the range, especially up into Canada. Um, so uh, here in Pennsylvania and in, in most parts of the of the uh, you know the the U.S. Uh, where brook trout occur. You know, brook, we generally don't see brook trout living past five or six years, um, and and rarely would they live beyond eight years, really anywhere in their range. So, um, 
they they generally mature at around age uh, two or three. Um, and the record size of brook trout that uh, uh, that was caught by an angler uh, was around 14 and a half pounds. I think it was like a 31 and a half inch fish uh, from Ontario uh, up in the Nipigon River. So you can see that, you know, especially historically, uh, uh, they did uh, um, attain some some very large sizes. Um, but uh, generally, uh, that's a that's a huge fish by today's standards. So next, uh, let's talk a little bit about brook trout life cycle. Um, this is a poster that uh, the, the Fish and Boat Commission developed in partnership with Pennsylvania Council of Trout Unlimited as part of the Trout in a Classroom program. And uh, the Trout in a Classroom is, is, a, is a really cool program um, in which uh, science teachers in particular um, will uh, can um, apply for a grant if they if they need funding and uh, to cover the cost of getting an aquarium and chiller and actually are provided um, trout eggs um, to raise out as part of their uh, science curriculum. So um, so this poster was developed, you know, to, as, to help educate our, our youth um, on brook trout. And uh, I just wanted to take a couple minutes and go over because it, it does a nice job of summarizing the brook trout life cycle. So uh, brook trout spawn in the fall and they do this uh, by the uh, the female excavating a nest that, that's referred to as a red. And so uh, the female brook trout will find an area of clean, uh, small, like piece-sized gravel. Uh, it's usually at a, a tail out of a pool or in some uh, uh, in a riffle type habitat with moderate flow conditions. And um, she'll she'll lay on her side and and use her tail to to dig a small depression in the gravel. And uh, there's usually one or more uh, males um, hanging around while while the the uh, female is excavating the red and and when she's done excavating the red um, she uh, begins to to deposit the eggs and, and the males uh, swim over and they they fertilize the eggs and then the eggs uh, settle down into the to the gravel um, where they um, where they stay all winter long so so uh, once the eggs uh, um, go down into the gravel. Actually, the female will will, will cover them up then with, with the uh, with uh, some some more gravel um, uh, so that they don't uh, get washed away, which certainly they can if there's a flood. But uh, but under normal flow conditions, this holds them in place. And, and, and as I mentioned, the, the eggs stay uh, within the gravel uh, where they incubate throughout the winter months. And then in the springtime, uh, usually it, it might be as early as late February in the southern part of the state, uh, probably more likely mid-March to late March, even in the uh, central or, or northern regions of the state. But those uh, eggs then um, continue to develop and they turn into what's called sac fry or, or leavens. And uh, the, the yolk sac is uh, what uh, you can see. Uh, pictured on on a slide under under the springtime portion of the of the slide, and uh, that continues to provide some additional nutrients to as as the uh, as the fish develops, and that that usually lasts for a week or two, and then after that they begin to uh, feed on zooplankton, which are just microscopic insects. Uh, they're coming down and floating down in a water column, and then. Um, as they continue to develop, then we often refer to them as as fingerlings or young of the year trout, and they actually grow pretty quickly uh, for their first year of life, and and oftentimes they uh, get to two or three inches long uh, by the end of summer, early fall. So uh, certainly the this is a uh, a strategy that that helps them to uh, this this fast growth in their first year uh, to to obtain as large of a size as possible. So that they have the ability to store, uh, you know, more nutrients for the lean winter months uh, that are that are to come. And so, certainly, the larger trout, um, uh, the larger fingerlings, uh, are, usually have a higher likelihood of, of surviving uh, the winter time because the winter kind can, in particular, be uh, hard on the trout, especially in low flow conditions when we have heavy ice cover, especially if there's ice forming on the bottom of the stream, what's called anchor ice, as well as surface ice. Oftentimes, the trout can um, uh, succumb to either uh, mechanical damage from ice flows or be displaced, um, especially during uh, if there's a rapid warm up and and uh, it causes flooding of those systems when there's ice involved. So but anyway, the, the faster they get to a larger size, the better. 
and certainly uh you know the the fingerling trout then you know we uh, uh, after their first year become age one fish and then they continue to grow throughout their life and as i mentioned you know adults often range from you know five to ten inches in length in, in our streams so um this is a uh if there's interest in this poster if uh i can provide this to kayla and uh you know anyone can follow up with her and uh we're happy to share this if, if you guys have a if anyone in the audience have, has a use for this you know the more uh we can do to, to educate each other uh the more it'll benefit brook trout as, as we move into the future so next i know i've talked a little bit about the range of brook trout um but we can talk about this in a little more detail so uh, brook trout are the only native inland trout species here to to eastern north america um here in the, in the u.s um uh the brook trout occur uh from northern georgia all the way up through maine following the following the appalachian mountain chain um they also have a pretty broad distribution as you get up into eastern canada and uh, the hudson bay drainages um, brook trout are also occur uh, in the northern midwest part of the u.s the great lakes drainages um, michigan wisconsin for example um, and they also occur in the uh, upper Mississippi Basin um, in the inland portion of Wisconsin and in Minnesota. Um, it's often referred to as the driftless area, for example. Um, and uh, they've also been introduced to higher elevations in the western in Western North America. So uh, brook trout are not uh, native to the Rocky Mountains in western uh, part of the of uh, North America, um, but they have been introduced there uh, in uh, you know, years past. And uh, uh, kind of like we sometimes have problems with uh, non-native species, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the West Coast, brook trout have caused problems for them with, with competing with their native cutthroat trout. So, um, so that gives a little overview of, of the range of brook trout. Um, I wanna talk, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, more about the range of brook trout here in a minute. Uh, I did want to uh, introduce what's called the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture. Um, this is a partnership between states and federal agencies, regional and local governments, businesses, conservation organizations, um, private citizens and, and others working to restore and enhance brook trout populations and their habitats across other native eastern range. And so Fish and Boat Commission uh, is an active member of the joint venture along with the, the other 17 states that occur from from Georgia up to Maine. And one of the really the key uh, or keystone projects of, of the Eastern Brook Trout joint venture is, is what's uh, referred to as a range wide assessment that usually occurs about every five years. Um, and what this is, is a it's a compilation of all the um, partner data from throughout the range from from uh, Georgia up to Maine, and, and it really gives a nice snapshot of how brook trout are doing um, throughout this uh, entire um, eastern range. So uh, this slide uh, shows a map uh, that would have been produced as part of the um, the last range wide assessment in 2015, and we're uh, the joint venture is getting ready to complete its uh, next range wide assessment, and so. Uh, the map shows again what the the overall distribution of brook trout from North Georgia up through uh, Maine here in eastern U.S. And uh, a couple takeaway things: the areas of gray and uh, yellow, and, and I guess what kind of looks as white on this map uh, are areas where uh, brook trout don't occur anymore. Um, the areas of red or, or, or pink uh, show areas where brook trout continue to occur, but um, their occupancy has has been reduced, and then the areas of green are are where uh, brook trout um, continue to have a a pretty uh, intact distribution um, throughout the habitats in those watersheds. So, um, the, some of the take home points from from the assessment are that you know around a third of the watersheds in this eastern uh, native range uh, no longer support brook trout, and brook trout occupancy, as we as we can see from the from the red coloration again. Uh, has been uh, reduced in, in in many others and really this is has has been a, a good tool to to show the need for increased conservation of brook trout habitat uh, throughout their you know native eastern range and um, 
and you can also see from the map that uh, the brook trout resources really substantially increase from Pennsylvania north to Maine, whereas they're much more uh, contracted uh, throughout the southern part of the range from from Maryland down to Georgia. Primarily, again, this is a water temperature um, limitation, so brook trout are occurring, especially in the southern parts of the range um, uh, at the higher elevations in the uh, Appalachian Mountain chain. So this map uh, shows the distribution of brook trout throughout Pennsylvania uh, as an output of the last uh, range-wide assessment in 2015. So all the subwatersheds on on this map, um, the different colors just show where brook, the the subwatersheds that either have um, allopatric brook trout, which is just referring to brook trout only watersheds, or or watersheds uh, in the yellows and the and the green uh, color, or even a little bit of the pink where brook trout are occurring with other trout species. But you can certainly see we can continue to have um, statewide distribution of, of brook trout with uh, the strongholds occurring uh, throughout the uh, the northern tier of the state where we generally have uh, larger blocks of public land, uh, watersheds that have you know higher percent forest cover and uh, you know, lower amounts of development and agriculture. So um, just to talk a little bit more about our brook trout, brook trout resources here in Pennsylvania, um, brook trout would have historically inhabited all of uh, Pennsylvania's cold water streams and rivers. And we currently have around 9,800 miles of streams uh, that support wild brook trout. So we certainly still do have a, uh, a substantial brook trout resource here, despite uh, some declines in, in their overall range in the state. Uh, the primary threats to brook trout um, range wide and in Pennsylvania are, are increased water temperatures as we talked about along with habitat degradation and those two things often go hand in hand. Um, the decisions that affect land use, water quality and water quantity along with climate change will primarily determine the fate of, of brook trout and, and we really have to work hard to conserve uh, streams that contain wild brook trout and, and protect their habitat and water quality for, from degradation and and one of the key aspects of this is public education and, and certainly I appreciate everyone tuning into this tonight because uh, the more that we can educate each other um, and be advocates for uh, clean water and uh, brook trout, uh, the better chance that uh, certainly brook trout have of, uh, of uh, uh, flourishing moving into the future. So the public education part of it is, is, is absolutely key. And even for folks that, that don't fish, for example, um, there's a strong link, obviously, as, as we've talked about, between having brook trout present and having good water quality. And so we certainly know that we all need clean drinking water. And so uh, when we have brook trout present, we, we again, even if we aren't, aren't fishing for them, we know that that's an indicator of, of superior water quality. And so making that connection, again, is, is, uh, is really critical. Um, and so uh, the more places we have brook trout, uh, the better it is not only for the uh, aquatic, aquatic ecosystems in the watershed, but also for um, you know the human populations that are living in the area as well. Um, so just again to talk a little more about some of the, the threats uh, facing brook trout. Um, brook trout are, are sensitive to changes in increased water temperature and habitat degradation. Um, streams lower in elevation and those already experiencing habitat and water quality degradation from uh, impacts such as urbanization and agriculture will be those that are that are most vulnerable to to climate change and um, brook trout populations in southeast and northwest pennsylvania uh, which are if we take a look at this map um, the areas in southeast and, and north uh, west pennsylvania you can see there's a lot of red and in uh, yellow in those areas, and, and um, these are areas that have been identified as, as areas that have uh, higher uh, risk of, of habitat degradation. And these areas are, are likely, or the brook trout that are continuing to occur in these areas are likely to be at high risk of decline due to urbanization, agriculture, again, uh, as well as climate change. So, so it's really important for us to continue with fishery monitoring um, throughout the state and and this is when we go out and we um, we sample the streams and, and to see what fish are there and, and for this 
for the fishery modeling that we do specific to, to wild trout, it really provides us with the necessary information that we need to, to help guide our, our future management decisions for, for brook trout as we move into the future. So um, just to summarize uh, what we went over so far, um, so we know that brook trout require full clean water and they're sensitive to increases in water temperature and habitat degradation. So protecting the streams that contact, contain wild brook trout from degradation of habitat and uh, or water quality is, is the most important component of, of fisheries management. And we know that Pennsylvania still does have a robust wild brook trout resource and that public participation in conservation and management is crucial to helping maintain and improve Pennsylvania's wild brook trout resources. So the, the last component that I wanted to cover tonight was, was just a little bit of information how you can find um, some some additional information on a, on a, if you have a particular stream in mind, maybe one that flows behind your house or um, you're just a, a somebody that might be new to getting into to, uh, fishing or thinking about fishing uh, for the first time, or maybe you're an avid angler and uh, looking for some new spots to try. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the maps that we have available on the Fish and Boat Commission website that can help you uh, identify where you might want to go trout fishing or actually there's maps for all all kinds of fishing that are that are available uh, through the interactive uh, mapping tool that's there. But since tonight's trout focused, uh, we'll stick with trout. Um, so on this slide is, is a screenshot of what the uh, uh, from the PFBC map gallery and um, so you can choose any of these um, uh, I would an easy place to start is on the county guide in particular whether it's the county you live in or county you might like to visit uh, so uh, that's a nice place to start which is in the upper left hand corner so if you just choose that um, uh, the there's a number of different layers you can turn on and off to to learn about the streams uh, that are occurring uh, across the state. So um, for just to provide an example, um, our Class A wild trout streams are what we consider to be our best of our best wild trout streams in the state. We have around uh, 3,000 miles uh, of, of Class A wild trout streams across the state. So I chose that layer. Um, you can see where I um, check the box next to Class A wild trout streams, and, and that turns that layer on if you didn't want to See that layer, you could just uh, check, uh, uncheck that box and, and it would go away and you could turn on uh, another layer or you can turn on multiple layers all at the same time if, if you choose to do that. So, uh, but this is a nice way to to learn uh, about where um, this, the state's uh, best of the best wild trout resources occur. And I, I chose this stream here in uh, Center County as an example just to uh, um, show since lots of folks uh, are familiar with Spring Creek. Um, it flows uh, in Center County uh, through State College in Belfont. Um, but if you go ahead and you, and you zoom into whatever stream you're interested in, you can just click on that green line for that stream section and a box will pop up like it's shown on my screen. And it, it'll give you some information on where that stream is located, uh, what the trout fishery is there, whether it's a uh, brook trout fishery, brown trout, um, mixed mixed trout species uh, and so forth. It also tells the amount of public land that, that's in that stream section. So that's uh, especially important if you're thinking about maybe going and fishing there and uh, you know you want to find a stream, for example, that's on public land such as state forest land. Uh, it'll it'll show you uh, whether that stream has has public land on it or not. And if you want some additional information such as um, general directions to uh, GPS coordinates for the lower section limit, you can uh, of that stream section, uh, you can uh, click on that lower um, link there and, and it'll give you directions. So so that's a nice uh, tool to, to have available. If you work better off of a, a list type uh, um, format, then we also do have the same information available uh, on lists. This is an example of, of the uh, of the class A wild trout list. Um, this is organized by the county of the mouth. Um, so 
Uh, again, if you just look at the first row uh, for Adams County, uh, the very first water is Carbaugh Run. Uh, it's a supports a brook trout fishery. It, it provides the section limits for that stream along with the lat, uh, lat long and the uh, number of miles that that stream section is and, and whether or not that that's in uh, or, or, or what percentage of that stream section is in public ownership. So a nice resource to have uh, if you're uh, especially if you're interested in getting out and exploring uh, for, for doing some wild brook trout fishing and that's one of the, the best parts of going wild brook trout fishing is that certainly um, there's not many places that wild brook trout occur that aren't scenic and, and aren't nice places to go and explore. Uh, the other listing that we have is uh, for all of our wild trout streams. So this would include our class A wild streams, wild, wild, our class A wild trout streams, but, but all other uh, streams that we have documented uh, wild trout to occur in uh, within the state. So this is a much longer list. Uh, than the class A list, but if you're interested in in uh, in uh, checking out uh, additional waters in, in addition to those that are on the class A list, then uh, you can check this list out as well. So um, with that said, I, I think I'll go ahead and, and wrap up um, for those folks that might be also interested in stock trout angling um, that you can use uh, one of those interactive maps as well to uh, to find stock trout fishing opportunities and Fish and Boat Commission has an app and uh, that's another good resource uh, that you can use, especially on the on the stock trout end of things. So. So with that, uh, Kayla, um, I think we're good if there's some time for questions. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple questions that came in. Um, there are. I'll just start at the top. I tried to write them down too, so I didn't miss any. Um, so what preys upon the eggs fry and the fingerlings? That's a good question. Um, certainly uh, if the eggs are dislodged, some of the eggs don't make it down into the gravel. If they're bouncing along the uh, uh, the stream bottom is, is uh, eggs are kind of semi buoyant, so um, fish that are uh, that are living downstream of, of where a, uh, a, tr a trout is spawning are certainly uh, always going to eat up those eggs when they come by. Uh, it's a great source of uh, nutrients uh, for fish. So um, sometimes other brook trout might eat uh, brook trout eggs that are occurring downstream or that are floating downstream and uh, uh, or other trout species. Um, Sculpins would also uh, consume those as well. Uh, certainly, uh, you know one of the benefits of of the eggs being protected in the in the uh, in the gravel is that it, it reduces predation on on the eggs, uh, uh, so it, um, so it really helps to protect them from from other fish um, getting at them. So once they're in the gravel, they're they're, they're fairly well protected. But certainly, uh, you know, if a crayfish is going to comes across an egg, uh, certainly I, I think for certain it, we would eat that as well. Um, a small percentage of eggs actually survive um, to adulthood. You know, it's in most systems, it's going to be uh, less than a couple percent. You know, and if we have a a high flow event like we had around Christmas this year, where we had um, you know two feet of snow, and then we got a couple inches of rain on top of that, and and I'm sure you saw the flooding in Harrisburg as we saw it here in Center County. That that's can be really detrimental to a uh, year class because it can really so that as we talked about the brook trout spawn in the fall so the eggs are in the gravel and you you get a big flood in the winter time like that it can really dislodge a lot of the, those eggs out and uh, you know obviously they're not going to uh, they're not going to survive and hatch out if they get the dislodged from from their nest so um, so while you know brook trout have certainly evolved to um, you know, sur survive in, in, in adverse conditions. Um, the more frequent uh, high flow events and low flow events that we're seeing as a component of climate change is, is certainly concerning. And, 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 you know, it's not uncommon for us to see uh, a, a good year class one year and then a poor year class the next. But uh, if we have multiple poor year classes in a row, then that can really uh, have a negative impact on populations, especially in areas uh, or in streams where the populations are just kind of hanging on. So um, okay. that's uh, yes. So the, 
eggs are a great food source. Um, that's why people fish them as a, as a bait um, or flies, you know, egg patterns. But uh, um, there's a uh, if they get lot dislodged out, yeah, they're not going to hatch. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. And then um, so just a reminder for anybody, if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, that's where I'm going down through and looking for any questions that you may have. Um, so we have another one. Why are why were brook trout introduced out west? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, uh, back in uh, 100 years ago or so, um, a common common practice in, in, in fisheries was to uh, you know, move fish all over the place. And that's how brown trout got here from Europe. And and that's how rainbow trout got to the east coast from from the west coast is that they were loaded on a train and and they were they were brought here and and uh, to try to provide for you know recreational angling and uh, food sources and so um, you know I think a lot has been learned and and it a lot wasn't understood at that point in time when fish were being moved around it, it's understood now especially with the uh, a competition between you know, native species and non-native species, and so um, so brook trout were, were were introduced out west to to provide for um, recreational angling, and and you know I think it it was a it was a common practice at that point, but uh, um, it wasn't understood then once they they got uh, established that they could outcompete uh, the native species that were there, and and oftentimes. Uh, non-native species do really well because uh, they don't have as many predators and they um, they may be a little more uh, um, adapted or able to adapt to uh, subpar conditions. Um, so for example, like brown trout, um, brown trout uh, do really well in, in our in our uh, limestone systems because they're very similar to the streams that they came from in Europe. And um, there, you know, our limestone streams, our spring creeks are, are very fertile systems and, and uh, a lot of them have undergone, you know, various uh, land use impacts over time. And, and it's not likely that brook trout will do all that well in, in most of our limestone systems now, even if, in, you know, even if brown trout weren't there. Uh, and, 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 you know, in, right now, brown trout are better suited to the, the conditions that occur in, in most of our uh, limestone systems. Just, just an example as well as, as to kind of answer that in addition to, to brook trout out west. So, you know, the, the fisheries managers in the, in the Rocky Mountain West are, are eradicating brook trout and, uh, you know, we're looking to restore them. So, yep. Great. Um, we have another one. Do I guess you kind of just answer this one a little bit. Um, do introduced brown trout compete with brook trout? Uh, they can, uh, not always, but they can, um, especially when conditions are, uh, there are some some habitat impacts, and in particular, if there's a, a stream that's already undergoing some habitat degradation, uh, such as increased uh, sedimentation or increased water temperatures, brown trout are a little more tolerant to both of those conditions than our brook trout, and that can help give them the the upper edge, but we've been doing fishery monitoring in, in, in a lot of places across the state for over 40 years or more. And if we're able to uh, maintain quality habitat uh, and, and, and good water quality, um, brook trout and brown trout uh, often seem to be able to coexist fairly well together. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, in, in areas where that are undergoing um, habitat impacts, that's generally where we again, we see non native species. Uh, being able to often do better. Okay. All right. Do you have time for a few more? Sure. Okay. Um, will riparian plantings help brook trout by helping to shade and cool streams, or are water temperatures more affected by other events and conditions? Uh, that's an excellent question, and then uh, I should have talked about riparian buffers, so I'm glad this uh, this person asked the question. So yes, riparian buffers uh, can really help to offset um, changes in land use, um, especially in watersheds where uh, there's increased uh, land uh, conversion to agriculture, for example. Um, 
riparian buffers uh, can can play a, a big role in, in trying to maintain cooler water temperatures or actually um, re reversing uh, so, you know a warmer temperatures that are occurring and, and and they don't have to be huge buffers so I think that's one of the uh, the important things that's been learned over time is that even a 35 foot buffer on either side of the stream uh, that's uh, uh, planted with with native trees can 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 have a huge benefit uh, by putting shade on the water and um, and providing a, uh, a place for silt and uh, you know um, other materials to sell out that may be coming in through stormwater and um, uh, um, some of the uh, some of the studies that have been done you know where they've used artificial shade cloth just to kind of uh, um, show what what uh, or how much water temperature could be reduced if if a stream was went from let's say like a, a pasture type situation where there's where there's very little overhead cover to a place where there's a riparian buffer it can be several degrees and just a couple hundred yards so uh, riparian buffers are huge and uh, so the more that we can do uh, with riparian buffers uh, the better uh, it's certainly a benefit to, to the fish it's a benefit to the insects it's a benefit to wildlife uh, there's a there's a lot of terrestrial wildlife species that uh, you know that those um, riparian buffers uh, really help out as well so yep uh, riparian buffers are, are definitely a good thing good good to know um and then what website is the the pfbc is that just Pennsylvania, the Boat Commission website. Yes, so uh, if, if anybody types Fish and Boat Commission, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, any other search engines, it'll take you right to our home homepage. Yep. All right. All right. Um, someone asked, how do the trout eat land insects? Oh, so that's a good question. So <clears throat> this, this kind of ties in with riparian buffers in particular. So ants um beetles you know they they're crawling on the uh the vegetation it's that's along the stream corridor and so when you get a little gust of wind or when uh you know an insect takes the wrong step and it falls off whatever it uh is crawling on then it falls into the water and then it becomes you know available food item for the fish so um so yeah that's why uh, dry flies are a great way to go have some fun uh, fishing for brook trout in the summer months because you have, you know, not only aquatic insects hatching and in, in the adult stage of those that are available to for fish to eat, but you also have terrestrial insects that uh, the fish like to look up and eat. So I know people who fly fish and they like to use the ants and things a lot to yep, catch. Exactly. Very good one. All right. Um, what is the impact of fishing adults on replenishment of populations? Yeah, so um, uh, I guess when we're when we're looking at how we're sustaining populations, uh, certainly healthy populations have have multiple age classes of fish. Um, we talked a little bit about that. We you know healthy populations can certainly uh, sustain having a missing year class every so often, um, uh, but uh, multiple year classes in a row can can really uh, set a population back. But as long as there's quality habitat there, uh, the population will certainly rebound itself. And and we know that brook trout are, are short lived species. So uh, a lot of the fish that are reproducing are generally uh, maybe only from four to, to five or six inches in length. And it's it's usually a, a pretty small percentage of the population that gets to to those larger size classes and um, uh, those those fish are certainly important to to the, the largest fish are certainly important to the population. So um, we certainly don't want to take more of those out than what the population uh, can can uh, sustain. Uh, but uh, when we take what we do as biologists is we have to um, weigh um, fishing mortality against natural mortality, and oftentimes we lose a large percentage of a population. We use a rule of thumb of around fifty percent each year to. To, to, that we often lose to natural causes. That's not saying that we lose all the bit, not all big fish or, or all little fish. Often we have a higher mortality rate of smaller fish than larger fish, but we do lose a lot of the fish to natural causes each year, whether it being predation, mechanical damage and floods and, and that sort of thing. So 
Um, that's where our fishery monitoring is really important, and we also are looking at the amount of angler use streams are getting. And so um, when we can put all that together, uh, it gives us as, as the fisheries managers uh, 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 the, 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 the data that we need to be able to understand is to say, OK, is, is fishing a, a limiting factor on a, on a stream? And, and in streams that have larger streams that do have uh, brook trout present, um, that have uh, you know that we consider to be like destination type fisheries. Uh, almost all of those have a, a special angling regulation on them that uh, ensures that uh, you know brook trout. We're maintaining the brook trout population at its highest level as, as possible. But uh, you know, and, and as far as most of our smaller streams, uh, you know, so some of our headwater streams uh, are, are a lot of those are very small in size. They aren't the type of streams that generally get a lot of fishing pressure, and, and some of them are actually really would be very difficult to fish. We consider them to be more ecological populations uh, than, uh, you know, areas that people would target for fishing. Okay. Right, so here's one. This one is from Mark, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, and he's probably smiling right now. Um, there's two words in here I don't know if I've seen before. He's asked, could you discuss Alochthenous versus autochthonous, autochthonous energy inputs to streams and the reason why brook trout evolved a fall breeding season. OK, so um, yeah, so we there's there's two ways that, that you know energy comes in the stream. It's either produced within the stream itself or it's from external sources. So um, you know, from a productivity standpoint, um, you know, most of uh, what's occurring in the, the headwater systems is uh, is from within the stream itself because we're not getting a lot of nutrients coming in off the off the landscape. Um, but uh, certainly, as we get down into um, uh, some of our moderate size waters, we we generally have more uh, nutrients that can come in from from the from the landscape and uh, you know help benefit some production there. So. Um, but you know, brook trout are uh, are a headwater species, and so that's really where they've evolved to live. Um, uh, and uh, you know, they do quite well under low productivity uh, environments. And um, uh, certainly, you know, they, they're they're adaptable because we we know they've not only had, occurred in low productivity headwaters, but we you know would have uh, they also occur in in more fertile spring spring streams and in, in, in lakes in particular in the northern part of the range. So um, the uh, so so yes, all all of wherever the nutrients come into the stream, it plays an important role in the primary production, which is obviously the base of the food chain and that just works its way, you know, up up, up through the food chain itself. On the spawning question, um, fall, you know, we Trout either spawn in the spring or the fall, so uh, brook trout and brown trout spawn in the fall, um, and uh, rainbow trout and cutthroat trout spawn in the spring. It's just the the life history strategies that those um, species ha have evolved with. Um, the uh, you know both or, or you know both time frames work for for those different species of trout. Um, the uh, the, the fall time frame, the brook trout generally spawn in, in uh, October, and uh, that can that can certainly trickle into November. And brown trout generally are more November into uh, early December for for a lot of our systems. And um, and uh, again, then you have a longer incubation period uh, for for brook and brown trout because their eggs are in, in, in obviously very cold water throughout the winter months. Whereas if you the rainbow or cutthroat trout that are spawning in the spring. Again, that's was in the uh, western part of the range uh, or in the western part of the US rather. Um, you know, they generally have a, a little shorter uh, incubation because the water is uh, generally uh, somewhat warmer than as compared to what the brook trout are going through in the in the winter. So um, that's how the species evolved. You know, that wasn't something that was, uh, uh, you know, directed by human intervention. That's uh, just how the species is, has evolved to exist over time. All right, thank you. All right, um, let's see. There's a couple more that have come in. Um, is catch and release still in effect for brook trout? 
E yes, so wild trout streams, uh, all wild trout streams are managed as under catch and release from the day after Labor Day through the following opening day of trout season. So um, we are currently in the catch and release period for, for, for uh, wild trout streams. That's correct. Okay. Um, work. this one goes back to the um, riparian buffer question. Um, is it better to plant evergreen or deciduous trees for riparian buffers? I didn't catch that whole question, but I um, oh. seemed like it was uh, it, it was asking you're asking about uh, deciduous versus conifers, but I yeah. it cut out after deciduous. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yep. So, yeah. So you know, oftentimes a, a combination of, of species are used, um, and also shrubs uh, like uh, shrubs that do really well in wet environments like uh, silky dog, nine bark, uh, willows. Um, oftentimes those can be planted right along the stream corridor and then further back uh, from this from the top of the bank. Um, we can come in with um, mature trees, um, you know, whether it's being sycamores, maples, oaks, you know, white pines. Um, you know, often it's a combination of, of species that are used and 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 it can be tailored to, you know, individual landowner um, interests for sure. You know, if there's a landowner that's really has an interest in, in, uh, um, you know, a particular species, but we certainly try to avoid, you know, creating a monoculture. Uh, and we, we like using a diversity of species um, to, to, to plant, to ensure that uh, the, uh, the success of that, that riparian planting. And um, so, yes, uh, again, as long as it's a, uh, uh, native, native species are used um, then in, in species that again that, that can can survive in uh, floodplain type environments then uh, yeah we'll any of its uh, options for using in riparian plantings yep okay um, do you have time for one more sure okay how far do brook trout move from where they hatch out Oh, that's a good question. So young of the year trout often stay relatively close uh, to the areas, uh, the stream reaches in which uh, they were, uh, um, uh, that they hatched out from. So, uh, you know, maybe within, you know, 100 yards or so, uh, I would say that's a reasonable rule of thumb. Uh, certainly some may move further, some that uh, get to place from flooding or um, what we found through uh, you know the movement work that we've been doing is that there's there's definitely a smaller percentage of the, of, of trout populations that generally are, are more mobile um, not necessarily as young of the year but that's uh, uh, but certainly as, as adults but some young of the year will will certainly um, slide around a little more than others but in general a lot of them stay fairly close but the adult fish there's certainly some of those that take on uh, long-range movements, uh, whether it be uh, at spawning time uh, to uh, to go to a preferred area to uh, uh, to, to reproduce, or um, if for fish that uh, overwinter in a larger main stem that we talked about or earlier, or fish that are um, uh, taking on a more migratory life history and and maybe moving out of a headwater stream into a, a larger uh main stem and and then swimming up into a different tributary stream you know the following summer and th those fish that take on longer range movements are really important to uh, maintaining genetic diversity in populations and um so they, they definitely play uh, a, an important important role in uh long-term long-term population uh, uh stability and, and sustainability and so that's again where we talked, I guess I briefly talked about culverts and other uh, fish passage impediments uh, as, as being a challenge and uh, you know, these, this would also include, you know, concrete um, pads that are sometimes have been poured under bridges in the past and um, uh, but culverts are, are a big issue. A lot of culverts were um, undersized and, and uh, so um, they result in increasing uh, the stream velocities to the point that brook trout or, or most other most fish can't swim through them uh, and or they're perched and or have very 
um, shallow flow uh, through them. And so these are all challenges to uh, to brook trout or other species, but since we're talking about brook trout in particular for like recolonizing streams. So especially if a stream goes through a, uh, a headwater stream, goes through a drop condition and the trout are lost in the upper portions of a stream, uh, if they if there's a culvert that's restricting them from recolonizing or getting back up in there, then you know that that whole stream may be gone from uh, from supporting brook trout in the future. So, so there's a lot of work being done by Fish and Boat, DCNR, uh, Trout Unlimited, and other partners to inventory culverts uh, across the state. That's a huge undertaking, um, but also then trying to prioritize and and uh, obtain funding for uh, uh, to to re replace. Uh, culverts with more fish fast, more fish passage friendly structures in uh, priority watershed. So, so, so certainly fish passage, the more we understand about fish, the more we, we, we realize it, uh, the importance of fish passage. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jason, for joining us tonight. Um, there, if you have any questions that we did not get to, um, Please, you can always email me. Um, I sent the link out early, earlier. You can just respond to that um, and we can try to get those answered for you. And then Jason, you had mentioned about that one slide. It was the poster if anybody wanted that um, just to contact me. And then I'll let you know. Yeah, or I can send you a PDF. I have a PDF uh, that our, um, our trout in a classroom coordinator shared with me. So I'll, I'll send you that and you know, I, I hope you can maybe even use it for some of your programs in the future, you know, and uh, there's some other good brook trout um, educational um, resources on our on our website and uh, if anyone's interested in those as well. Yep. All right, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we would love to have a copy of that. We can definitely use it in our okay. purpose. Yeah. All right, so thank you again. Um, we hope to see everyone back again in two weeks on February 9th. I believe it is um, for our Firefly lecture, and that will be on Office Suite HD again. Um, and I will be sending that link out the day before. So if you haven't registered, go ahead and do that if you're available. And then also for our final lecture on February 23rd, which is going to be about mushrooms um, because they're not a state species, but we are the mushroom state. So we wanted to cover that as well. So thank you again. I have this recorded and um, I will be sending a link out to some of you who requested that. So thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Hi, Baba. Hi, girls. Hi. Hey, Pappy. How are you? Good. I to make sure you're not listening to the whole team. It is. Is that we're hiding? <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>
Yep. I think everybody else can too. Mm-hmm. Okay, we better get off. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>